Yeah, yes. There we go. Good afternoon. I'm thrilled to have the lovely Jason with me. Hello, Jason. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Jason Monaghan. I was an archaeologist at one point, and then I was a crime writer, and then I was a financial regulator, and then I worked in a merchant bank, and then I became a money laundering specialist, and then I ran a museum service for 15 years, and now I'm back to being a crime writer again. <laughs> I currently live in, I currently live in um, South Yorkshire, uh, but I've spent a lot of time living in the Channel Islands, I do tend to travel around a lot as well. Um, I'm currently working on a series of uh, books in the 1930s, you know, sort of an alternative 1930s, but, also, but most of my books so far have been um, archaeology mysteries or serious archaeology books as well. So that's me in a nutshell. Yes, obviously uh, not jealous at all of all your photos from Botswana. <laughs> From your safari, it's uh, yeah. While I was sitting in Mankey Newton, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> amazing. Mm. So the first time that you decided to sit down and be a crime writer, what was the motivation? What was the moment that you thought, okay, now's the time. Now I'm going to sit down and write that book. Well, I always wanted to write, even as a kid, like a lot of us did. I, I wrote terrible you know, sub-Tolkien fantasy in my teens. And, and I experimented with science fiction when I was at university. And then I um, had the idea of writing a, a, a thriller. A bit, I, was, I was reading things like Jeffrey Archer and Desmond Bagley and Wilbur Smith at things at the time. Um, and I thought, I'll write a thriller. So I'd already written a book that was dreadful and nobody was any interested so I wrote this thriller about uh it was about sort of money laundering and things in the Caribbean and and things like that and I sent it off started sending it off to agents and then of course in those days because this is a while ago now you had to type you had to print it out on paper and put it in an envelope and post it which is very expensive and very time to see process but about the third agent I sent it to was um was Anne Medici in London I didn't know it was one of the UK's top agents at the time and she wrote back to me and said, well, you know, there's a lot of this stuff about, but you can clearly write. Why don't you write me a mystery set in the world of archaeology? Given I was an archaeologist, because I'd, I'd only just, you know, I'd just got my first job in archaeology at that time. Uh, I was about, about 30 when this conversation is coming up. So I, I'd already written half an archaeology thriller and, and not quite anywhere with it. And I'd also, also written a, a sort of Kingsley Amis type academic skit. And that was dreadful. And um I thought, oh I know, let's 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 say I've got this story called Byron's Shadow. Um uh set it by archaeologists in Greece. So I, so I started it, got two thirds of the way through it, thought I don't know how to finish this book. Oops. <laughs> And then I remembered this dreadful academic skit I'd written. And I'd also written a gothic novel about a, a girl vanishing into a satanic cult. And I thought, hang on a second, let's take the characters from this book and the plot from that book, merge them, <laughs> put it together with the research I did for my PhD thesis on, on Swamplands of Kent. And I had a novel and I wrote it quite quickly at that point. And that became uh, a book called uh, Shadow of the Corn. Which is now reissued as Darkness Rises, um, and she that and Lizanne sent that up to Seven House, and they liked it. That published that in nineteen ninety three, believe it or not, um, and then they gave me a, a three book deal on the back of that. And so Byron's Shadow, which is the one set in Greece, by that time I'd worked out an ending for it. So that, and having intended being the first book, ended up being the second book. So actually, if you read them, they sort of they the timelines of the two overlap. Uh, and uh, when I got to revise them for Loom, I deliberately put Easter eggs in one and payoffs in the other so that the the, the books in the series actually almost like cross refer to each other. Uh, and so if you get to number four, you go, oh, gosh, yeah, I read about that in number one. Little, little treats. Out. So anyway, so I, I had to turn out one one book a month for one book every nine months for Seven House. And I did that in the 90s. So I ended up with the four Jeffrey Flint. Archaeology Mysteries, um, 
the third one was called Shades Moor. And by that time, I'd moved to Yorkshire. Uh, I was working in York, so Shades Moor was set on the, largely on the North York Moors uh, and in and around York. That was fun. And then I did um, one called Lady in the Lake. Uh, quick nod to Chandler there. Uh, about Arthurian legend, uh, and that set out in the West Country, and uh, uh, and then after a few years, I, I wrote a, I wrote a fifth one uh, as well, and and added that on the back series as well. So that's how I got into crime writing, really. Uh, and I joined the Crime Writers Association in ninety about ninety three or so. Got my agents nudging, and I met a lot of great people there. Uh, the first person I ever signed a book for was Martin Edwards, actually. It was nice. He brought one along and said, hey, just got this one. Wow. I said, there you go. And uh, Martin was just starting out as well then, at the same time. So it was quite fun. Hello. <laughs> I won't tell you how old I was in 1993. I was alive. <laughs> <but> I was <laughs> <old>. <laughs> no. um, so why did you stop then? And then why did you restart? Right. Okay. Um, well, I'm a celiac. Uh, and I didn't know I'm a celiac. Uh, and so I was actually quite ill through a lot of the 90s and the noughties. Um, and I had some children and a mortgage and being quite ill. And it just, it was all just too much. I'd, I got a proper job as a financial regulator, which wasn't great. Um, and then I did that for f uh, three years. I thought I said some rubbish on the gun be a reporter so I went to work for a newspaper for 10 days uh, didn't really work out and then my previous boss said I'll come back and we'll promote you so I came I went back and it promoted me and I did another couple of years um and I was still getting ill on and off and um then I I, I wrote I was, I'm all I'm writing archaeology books as well at the same time because I, I trained as an archaeologist so I'm writing basically a non-fiction book then a fiction book in sort of alternate years I've got about nine or ten non-fictions now and a list of academic papers as you know as long as this table um and then i uh i thought i can't do this i just can't do this and um on 9 11 actually not actual 9 11 i actually quit uh, it was actually 9 11 we entered into a meeting I came this meeting i can't do this anymore so i can't it's not me sitting in an office you know listen to this garbage and I came out and the world's ending planes crashing to towers and things and I was going oh what are we gonna do well, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna buy a fridge because my fridge had just broken down so I've got to go and buy a fridge so I left everyone to it went to buy a fridge went home and then just quit over the phone the next day and just sat there with my feet up watching watching the two twin towers disaster and then after about a few months I was headhunted by a law firm to head up an anti-money laundering consultancy, which was quite fun, really. It, it didn't have a lot of traction, but teaching people about fraud, financial crimes, scams, how to avoid them, uh, it was actually quite jolly. You know, I, I had a, I had, I built up two whole arch files of frauds I'd come across. Uh, I had my own fake passport, I had a fake driving license, I had this massive great big wad of uh, Monopoly money that I printed off that I'd use in demonstrations. I had um, little visual aids. I had, uh, I had I had gonks and widgets. I tell this story about about this company trading gonks and widgets and how it was used for for, for covering up financial fraud. And it was good fun. Um, and then I was headhunted again by one of my clients who I'd been um, helping to train and helping out. And they recruited me as their compliance director for the offshore group. So from Never having worked in a bank, I was suddenly the director of Merchant Bank um, in charge of part of that offshore group, which wasn't really me, but apparently I was I was quite good at it. So I did that for a few years. Um, it got me got me around a bit. Um, it's probably paid for me to retire early, uh, which was nice. Um, and uh, yeah, so I did that for a few years. And then all the time I wanted to go back into archaeology. And uh, I carried on writing, didn't get very far, I was busy, I was working in the bank, uh, and my children were growing up. And um, then uh, I applied for every job going uh, in in uh, in the local museums, didn't get it, didn't get it, didn't get it. I was living in Guernsey by this time, the Channel Islands. And then um, the, the director of the museum group came up, the, the top job came up. And I got it. And bizarrely, one of the reasons I got it, because I had all this experience in banking. 
which, which was ironic, really, because, you know, I was, you know, a qualified archaeologist at SIP publication list. And uh, one of the means I'm being recruited is because I've got this experience in banking and and dealing with difficult people all day, every day. So, uh, so I ran a museum for 13, 14 years, which was great fun. It was about the best job ever. I mean, you know, I had a castle. I had you know, 50 historic sites, had prehistoric dolmens, an art gallery, you know, and it was it was brilliant. Every but it did feel like being on a roller coaster because every January we'd sit there saying, "Right, we've got a museum opening on the third week of January." Then this and that. And the whole year we'd be pegged out with museum openings and gallery openings and and special occasions. And then uh, we'd always do something on the Queen's birthday, twenty one gun salute, this that the other. And the governor would come. And it was this great, great, great world of stuff. But I started writing again. It inspired me, and I started writing again. I self-published a historical novel um, and a book of short stories, and then Endeavour uh, picked up my Jeffrey Flint books, the five of them, to republish as e-books, because e-books had been invented. Yay! And so they had a second release, and then they became Loom, and then Loom uh, re-reissued them under my own name, which was nice. Uh, and then I just started writing new things. Uh, and... Um, you know, um, take it from there, really. Yeah. Quite a journey. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. It doesn't make any kind of sense. You read the CV and you go, what? <laughs> yeah. It's funny how many um, <laughs> authors have yeah. come from finance, yeah. so I guess because finance is so boring, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting. I was at the new blood panel at Prime Fest last year, or the year before, and every author bar one had already been a successful something else. They've been a journalist and a BBC producer and a soldier and a policeman and a lawyer and then someone who'd been to the UEA crime writing course and was writing in an attic. But there was only one of them. You know, everybody else had, was in their 40s or 50s and had already had already been successful at something else and probably, in brackets, already paid their mortgage off. Close you know, those brackets because it does help. Um when I was you know, in my 30s working in, in an attic, literally I was working in an attic, and with bills to pay on the back of my crime writing, it, it, it does get a bit tense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know I'm very envious while I do my day job and all these people are talking about, you know, just writing and traveling. And like, mm, yeah. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. So you've got a new release... Uh, is it Thursday, tomorrow? I can't remember. Tomorrow. Just tomorrow. Mm. A bunch of you copy. Yeah. You put tomorrow. Um this is this is well Black Shirt Rebellion. It's the third of my um Black Shirt series, following on from oh I've got visual aids, look, back in the old mm -hmm. days. Starting with Black Shirt Masquerade and then Black Shirt Conspiracy. And this is an idea I came up with just before the pandemic. I was actually working on another series at the time, which is still bumbling under. And then during the first lockdown, I wrote an art biography. And I also wrote Black Shirt Masquerade. Uh, so as soon as it, the dust cleared, I started looking for a publisher and more or less straight away got level best in America. Interested. Uh, and so they've published they've published a series, a third one out tomorrow. And the whole idea of this is I wanted to write um I wanted to write a book about a good man working for bad people. So uh, I quite like, for example, SSGB and Dayton or um uh, Robert Harris's Fatherland, both of which are alternative histories, which get sort of got me thinking um there were a lot of books but i had a look around there were a lot of books written about now about uh detectives working with the nazis there are quite a lot of them um uh, luke mccallan for example um and i thought mm, that's a bit that's that's a bit of a full field now uh and my german's not terribly good either so i thought right how about a intelligence agent working for the british union of fascists Right, that's a good idea. In the 1930s, the British Union of Fascists was launched at the end of 1932 
Tony had an eight year life and it was wound up in 1940. Um, and it was never particularly successful, but it was actually very scary. And if, if you know, if they'd actually had, if they, if they had been as powerful as the people who opposed them thought they were, and if they'd lived up to their own dreams and expectations, it would have been quite a scary organisation. So my thought was, what if they had actually been, had they had been the organisation they wanted to be, rather than the backbiting shambles they actually were. Um, so I, and then somebody said to me, uh, another writer said, well, why don't you write a book about how this came about? Right. So Black Shirt Masquerade, what I've got in Black Shirt Masquerade is there's an army officer, Hugh Clifton, uh, late 20s, who is, he's out in India and he gets caught up in a riot and is, is critically injured in a riot. And everyone thinks he's going to die. So the army says, actually, let's pin, let's pin the blame on him, you know, for it. And then he recovers. And they went, oh dear. So they have to court martial him and throw him out. So he's, he loses his friends, he loses his wife, he's back at his father's house, miserable and fed up. And then one of his army friends says, I've got a job for you. Come to London, join the black shirts. No risk, no danger. Just go to a few parties and tell us what they're up to. So, of course, there is risk, there is danger. Um, so he says, yes, yes, it, it goes along. And I, it's no secret. So that's the backstory of it. In the first chapter of the book, he joins. Uh, Sir Oswald Mosley's British Union fascists. Um, they have a security outfit known as the Black Shirts. They basically wear collarless black shirts and they act as security for all the, the fascist meetings and start holding quite scary parades as well. Um, they, they model themselves on Mussolini's uh, black shirts in Italy. So Hugh joins the Black Shirts because he's a big guy. He's you know, six foot two and, you know, uh, and he'd been in the army and can carry himself. And so he joins the Black Shirts. Uh, and at, the, at his first parade, he gets involved in a shooting. And when I saw the Trump shooting the other day, I thought, hang on a second. You've got, in, in the book, you've got a fascist politician at a rally. Somebody shoots at him, misses, and then all hell blokes loose. And this is what triggers the whole plot, because Hugh actually intervenes to to try and, you know, again, to try and get the assassin and becomes a front page hero and so having been you know, a secret agent he now describes himself as the world's worst secret agent <laughs> because by the end of chapter one is on the front page of the daily mail in his fascist uniform <laughs> doing the salute <laughs> and his mi5 <laughs> handler goes right okay and that but then he's stuck because the fascists think he's their hero uh, and, you know, these these communist agents get killed and everyone thinks it's him and it's not him. Um, and the communists want to kill him. And MI5 sort of disown him. And the police want to arrest him because he's a fascist. In fact, they do arrest him several times in, in the course of this series. Uh, and so he gets a fascist girlfriend, his best friend, because they're the only people who talk to him. So the entire series, he's <laughs> he's embedded in the fascist movement, not believing what what everyone around him is believing without it. So, uh, and then he gets involved in, uh, well, in various thriller plots, plots against the crown, plots against the country. The first book is essentially a plot to make the fascists a better organisation. And the second book is set around the abdication crisis of 1936. And the third book is set in 1937, when there was a sort of schism in the fascist movement. That's the new one. Because, believe it or not, the British Union fascists were not the worst organisation in Britain at the time. There were people like the Imperial Fascist League, who, if you read what they wanted to do, you think, really? Um, and then you had the the White Knights of Britain, who basically went around in hoods like the Ku Klux Klan and the National Socialist League and the British National Socialists and the British Fascists and the, the Imperial Airmen, and it goes on this list and list and lists of all these crazy swivel eyed right wing organizations in Britain in the 1930s. So the third book is, is Hugh having fun with these various organizations um, and all the time building on this reputation he's got as being, you know, somebody says, well, he's the most dangerous man in Britain. And his girlfriend goes, no, he's not really. He's not really. <laughs> but he's, everyone thinks he is. He's this big you know, scary fascists on the front page of the Daily Mail. Uh, and so he has to, has to sort of balance these two 
these two reputations he has, uh, this big reputation, and then, and then trying to sort of do good behind the scenes with the power he's got without falling too deeply into the darkness. And that's, and that's actually about the challenge because, you know, when you do have power, people with power tend to forget what little people are like, what it's like. I mean, he's it, 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 quite rich. At one point, he ends up skinned. He's going, I forgot what it was like to have no money. Um, and at another point, he's just, you know, he just basically gathers up this bunch of uh, thugs from the Nordic League Um and he's going to work them over, and he says, "Hang on a second, this is I'm becoming I'm becoming what everyone accuses me of being," and he says, he "Must he must stop it, really?" So you know, I've just had a lot a lot of fun with 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 that sort of yeah, with that sort of idea. Yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> mm. um, I take it there was a lot of research involved for that, because that sounds far yeah. away from the other stuff that you've done so far. Mm. Yeah. The, the yeah, I've got a shelf and a half of quite dodgy books about <laughs> British fascists, and, and including quite. It's really quite hard to get to get the truth of the story because you find a lot of stuff written by communists in the nineteen thirties because they were romantic heroes, but actually fascism ended up on the wrong side of history. So people who were fascists in the nineteen thirties went very quiet during the war, and you. There was not much about from more from ordinary people. I've I've come across a few books now and a few articles now written by just ordinary paper hangers or bakers boys and things who who, who joined the fascist movement, and that's been great. It's given me a lot of context for the ordinary members because most of them were not evil people who wanted to dominate the world, and a lot of a lot of BUF members had come straight from the Communist Party. They'd worked out that communism wasn't going to work. Let's try fascism instead. Uh, Mosley, well, Oswald Mosley, the leader, um, came from the Independent Labour Party, as did a lot of their members. So they basically wanted uh, end to slum housing, lower unemployment, better wages, no European war. Um, you think, yeah, yeah, tick, tick, tick. But the end of parliamentary democracy and the rule by the leader mm, actually not that's not quite sure um so it was a mix of it was a mix of um radical socialism and like authoritarian patriotism sort of mingled together but then that's after about 1933 34 some of the original members started dropping out and the street violence started taking over the guys in black you know 10,000 black shirts in the street let's go and let's go and beat some Jews up um, and the anti-Semites then start taking over the organisation and the, the rhetoric gets more and more like the Nazis. Because obviously Hitler didn't take power until 1933 and Mosley modelled himself on Mussolini, but by 34, 35, he's cozying up to Hitler more. So a lot of his rhetoric starts sounding more like Hitler and his, the uniform of the black shirts changes to look like more like the SS, and they got these little armband logos which look pretty much like the SS, and their flag is changed. It looks like a bit like a swastika, and so on. Um, so, and the, the, one of the interesting things is is how quickly everything changed in the organisation. People came, people went, people got promoted, people got sacked, and um, the organisation ballooned in membership and then shrank away to nothing. Um, which which is for a thriller writer gives it loads of opportunities for people coming and going and changing and and plots building up and internal and they all hated each other you know there were the, the intellectuals who wanted uh, to win the hearts and minds of people through the joys of fascism and then the militarists who basically just wanted to seize power and have done with it and then there were the there was also like a school of almost like bored Tories they wanted Britain to be like it used to be you know, and that's why they joined the fascist party. And uh, uh, and there was a whole mix and mingling. And there were and a lot of people who joined them were just unemployed. They were uh, they were unemployed unemployed men, bored middle class housewives. Um, uh, there's a there's a clutch of characters in my book who are, are de ex debutantes, and they and they join it for a lark, 
and they actually become they actually become made they become major characters certainly in the second and third books they're um they, they sort of little trio of ex deputants actually are at at the core of the plot um one thing because certainly at the time it was a very very chauvinistic time men particularly on the right wing didn't take women very seriously and the idea of a female secret agent or a female secret policeman was just above people's heads and so the the series called the agents of room z but the female agents get a lot of leeway because almost no one sees them coming um well you know sort of things and uh uh yeah so so i do have quite a lot of fun with the, the the female agent certainly in the later books because it gives again I, i'm a bloke but it gives me uh, it gives me a lot of opportunity to poke fun at you know 1930s sexism mm -hmm. because you know i've got you know this this bunch of of radical radical right wing feminists if you can get what mm -hmm. I, I, I can imagine um which because actually a lot of suffragettes joined the black shirts Because they were fed up of um they were fed up of just not making any progress as well. let's 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 hitch ourselves to this wagon. So um that's that's a tune as well. So I've got I said I've got a big big pile of books and um some of them are a bit dodgy. But you know, that's a, and there's good old Google. <laughs> yeah. And every now and every now and again I I I Google something and I get uh, things like this site is not allowed to be reviewed in West Germany. But, okay. <laughs> <Maybe it's> like, <laughs> Uh, no. when, I, when I was looking at looking up, I wanted a fascist marching song for them all to sing around the dinner table, <laughs> and I was looking them up on this website, and they said you're not allowed. I think it was a Russian website. You're not allowed to be in West Germany because at some point Hugh, um, he was getting getting himself into a corner at a dinner party about about the fascists having no intellectuals and no decent songs, and someone said, "You write us a song then," and it, and he comes out afterwards, says to his girlfriend, "I got out of that." didn't I? And she says, no. She says, because you're going to write a song now, aren't you? <laughs> and so he has to write the fascist marching song, uh, which is uh, uh, just quite, quite an amusing episode. I do I do try and keep the tone light in places um, because otherwise it would just get too grim. Um, and, you know, because he doesn't believe it, he does poke fun. He does poke fun at it sometimes. And his colleagues, sometimes it goes over their heads. And sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> um, how did you keep track of all your characters and everything? Because it sounds like you've got quite a few. The, 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 actually, one criticism of the book, you probably it does actually have a, quite a big list of characters. Um, I just know them. Um, I, in my very, very early books, I used to have little index cards. I used to write down all the facts and figures on them. But now I, I sort of know them well enough, and I just have a I've got a little a little database. Um, well, not database. It's, it's, it's posh. I've got a file when people were born, largely, and anything significant they did. You know, when when was Hugh born? When did he go to university? When did he go to the army? When did he get married? Just things like that, so it stays consistent. Um, and then I've got another file called Who's Who in the nineteen thirties. So. It, Every historical character I'm including, I've got a little potted biography of who they're about 30, there's about 30 or 40 of them in there. Some of them are only, you know, one-line mentions, but you know, what was Churchill's job at the time? You know, when did when did this person join the black shirts? When was he kicked out and so on? And and also a lot of these things, all these different silly little organizations that that were being formed and broken up and things like that, just keeping track of all them. Because although there's some alternate well, there is alternate history in here. In these books, I try to keep as much as possible real, you know. So um, it's stuff that didn't happen but could happen um, uh, for for the most part. So it's not it's not diverging too far from reality. So you know, Winston Churchill has the same job in 1936 that he had in in reality. And he, he takes the same position on the abdication crisis as he did in reality. And he gives the same speech at the Albert Hall on November the 3rd as he did. Because I, I do, I write, one thing I do is I write a timeline 
breach story about a historical timeline, what actually happened in 1936. And then I write, and then I break the plot into plot strands because most of my plans have got several plots. What's happening in that plot strand on that particular day? And then I've got an alternative history stand where I'm saying, yeah, okay, that might have happened, but this is happening instead, um, which is as minimal as possible. But there's, there's, there's one point I'm writing, and it gets to November. It's in, that, in November 1936, the Crystal Palace burned there. So I had to include it because it's out for dinner that night and Crystal Palace is on fire. You can't just, just skate over it or the, you know, the Italian invas invasion of Abyssinia everybody was talking about it so um and then the latest book um i got to back i got to the point i do you know the detail edit which is about my fourth draft and i started looking up um phases of the moon so i've got the moon on the correct day and then i looked started i, I looked up the weather i think i and set in the weather in 1937 was appalling apparently it was really horrible you know it's it supposed to the coronation it rained during the coronation it rained during most of the garden parties uh there were thunderstorms and there was the biggest storm for 10 years right in the middle of my plot <laughs> and i couldn't ignore it i couldn't i can't, I can't ignore the since since Withens day storm of of uh july 1937 it's got to go in uh, and it actually then took a character of its own because actually when I'm writing it, so everyone is, like being English, everyone is whinging about the weather. <laughs> you know, they're on the train trying to get away. This woman's trying to engage in a conversation. Terrible weather we're having, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, but all the way through, they're just moaning about the weather. They have a secret meeting and they're going, you know, we're going to have to get inside or it's going to rain. And, and so the whole book's got this theme of appalling English weather in the summer. Even the German spies dip about, dig about it when he's <laughs> when he meets up with you, moaning it. And it's throwing it out of rain and he goes, yep, England in the summer. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that attention to detail as well. Um, I saw, well, you know, I was at Bloody Scotland this weekend and Chris Whitaker, who takes four years to write a book, but he said he had three screens. On the one side, he had um, pictures of all the places so mm. lots of pictures of all the location, all the flora and fauna, mm. and everything on the other screen. He had things like weather and um, phases of the moon. So he had it all around him, and in the middle was his manuscript. And I was like, okay. yeah, I'm not sure I could. That would, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you've yeah. got it all there to hand, I suppose. Yeah, well, it is. It, it, it is fun doing reconnaissance. I mean, there was um, there's a riot uh, in. Well, there's riots in several of the books, but uh, there's a particular riot in the second book. Uh, and I went and walked the ground and I thought, right, OK, where's a good place for a police barricade? I'll, I'll put it there. And oh, oh, hang on. There's a side street there. Who's 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 in that side street? And where would I put the snipers? Oh, they'd go up there. And, and, uh, and I, I just walked it. I thought uh, one of my I put it on Facebook, actually. One of my police friends sent, oh, hostile reconnaissance, he said. <laughs> Because there was a particular government building I was going to break into as well. So I just wanted to have a look where its front door was and how many guards they had on it without looking like I was actually planning on uh, breaking into a government building with uh, 50 black shirts. Um, so it is, it is quite fun. And also there's a, a, a character, again, in book two, whose house I managed to find in London. So again, I wanted to find out, does this building have a back door and where is it? So again, I was, I was wandering around garages and car park. oh yeah it's got packed door doesn't it there it is right um and then which way does it go oh it goes that way to try and get as much of the detail as possible right most people won't notice but you know if, I, you know you get it wrong yeah you've got to don't you? <laughs> yeah yeah i'm worried about a train in the latest novel i've asked two i've asked i found two train people to ask about this train i'm still I'm still going to get an email from somebody about this train. I just know it. But, um, mm. um, who's the coolest or most unusual contact that you've gained from writing then? If you've got a police contact, if you've got any cooler... Oh, no, know? I no, I, I don't I don't really do that. I mean, well, I've got... Well, my, my, my son-in-law is a policeman and I've got some ex-friends who are policemen. Uh, it's just uh, it's just random people on Facebook when I'm coming in. Uh, I don't I don't cultivate 
a lot of people, you know, cultivate a police contact or a, or a doctor contact. I don't do that. I just, I just, I just tend to. I've got a lot of books, and I've got, I've got fourteen bookcases like this one behind me, um, and there is the intranet, which I don't always trust, but it's quite useful. And then just random, then random friends. I'll just, um, you know, I, I, I think I broke my toe last week, and so I <laughs> messaged the nurse I know. <laughs> I've got broken toe. Ah, oh, don't worry about it. Okay, shall I go to the hospital? No, they won't do anything. Okay, all right then. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but there, I mean, it does worry me sometimes. Things like, I mean, firearms are always a difficult one because a lot of people, people who know about guns, know a lot about guns. So you got to be a bit, bit careful about firearms. And um, so I'm thinking, does this does this weapon have a safety catch? Oh, it doesn't. Oh, that's a bit weird. Um, and so I actually might even put that line in. Uh, I'm not going to say it doesn't have a safety catch. I'm so he's making the observation it doesn't look like it's got a safety catch. <laughs> so just in case something goes out. Uh, and I've been having a fun with a Luger in the latest book because everyone thinks Lugas, you know, there's Lugas are cool, but I've seen so many things about them being dangerous and inaccurate and jamming and things like that. So I'm having a bit of fun with this Luger being really quite rubbish. <laughs> Awesome. And yeah. um, if your books were made into films or TV series, which of your own characters would you like to play? Oh, look <laughs> like uh, I mean, who who would I like to play the characters? No, who would you? I like really to... don't know. Oh, would I like to play? Yeah. Uh, right. Um, <laughs> Just to well, make I. I'm a bit old. I mean, because uh, now uh, most of my characters tend to be quite young people. I, I grew a beard uh, when I was on safari. And when I came back and was wearing my reading glass, I thought, my goodness, I look like Jeffrey Flint would look like when he grew up because he's got a beard. And I, I've never had a beard apart from that one week. I thought, gosh, I'd look like Jeffrey Flint. Um, yeah, so my, my, most of my characters are in their um, 20s and 30s in both, in both my series because uh, obviously I was in my 20s when I was writing the Jeffrey Flint series. Uh, and so it was all about universities and, and, and young people. And then the black shirt movement is absolutely full of young people because even Oswald Mosley was only 40 when he found the British Union fascists. You know, Lord, you know, William Joyce, um, Lord Hawha, was 29, I think, when he became, you know, their director of propaganda. Very, a very, very young movement. Um, and so, yeah, I've not really got that many people of my age at all in there. Um, could play it. No, no, I can't. I can't really see a role for me at all, sadly. Well, you need mm. to sort that out in the next book, <laughs> just in case. Yeah, yeah. Well, I did. I have. I've, I've been wondering about uh, writing a, a fifth Jeffrey Flint novel, but separating it from the original series. And making Professor Flint finally, he finally, finally, finally gets promoted, and so he's older, possibly wiser, <laughs> probably not, um, in his in his fifties, uh, and, and he can then get into more scrapes. But there'll be old man scrapes rather than young man scrapes. Um, but he's he's probably not grown up at all, actually. Uh, but I did, I have, I have actually got a couple of plots for him, and may actually. You know, one dark night actually may actually get down to writing them. And obviously, I would never say that you know men never grow up and they're just boys in men's bodies because that would be sexist. I'd never, you know, I'd never uh, say anything like that ever. <laughs> no, well, they don't grow up; they tend to get just get bigger. Yeah, uh, just... I, I, I mean, personally, I'm you know I'm still, you know, uh, I, I I'd say one thing I haven't lost. Um, sense of wonder you know for all the stuff you've done in life um from being a child wanted to write those fantasy novels getting older and not losing that sense of wonder right? the sense of excitement you know we're just going on safari going oh, there's a lion and it's like six feet away from literally six feet away from me and it's looking at me and it's ignoring me completely <laughs> right okay um, because I, I, that was a that was the weird thing about it. Because previous safari I've been on, we weren't supposed to go within fifty yards of anything. 
you know, so the truck would stop and they were over there somewhere. But because of the Botswana, we're in and out of the bush, and actually driving on these dirty track, dirt tracks in the bush, you just come in between two trees and stop, and there's a pride of lions there. And they look at you and then they go back to doing their lion like things. They get a truck of people. And they just think, and and one one of them at one point, because we saw 33 lions, at one of them at one point, this lioness got up, she walked round the truck to my side and lay down in the shade of the truck. She decided the truck offered better shade than that tree, just not caring. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, so sense of wonder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's don't cool. lose it. I think actually as a writer, you need that anyway, don't you? To some extent. Anyway, you've got to, otherwise... I don't think you'd be able to write if you didn't wonder what happened next or, you know, the what if that everyone says. If you don't have that, I don't see yeah, how to yeah. write, really. No. T tell me, you, you you describe yourself as a pantser. Yes. Do you have any kind of murder board? No. You don't have a big, big board with pictures on and, no. and lines? And... Yep. Oh, right. Okay. Absolutely yeah. nothing at all, no. it's. I know people find it really strange, but genuinely... When I open my laptop is when I decide what's going to happen in my book that day. That's it. Right. Yeah. I also have something called aphantasia. So I can't see, you know, people say that they can see their story as a video in their heads and I can't. So I think that perhaps that's why as well, because there's no point. I can't see it. So I just make it up as I go along anyway. And... Yeah, that's it. I mean, I, I like to have a structure because my plots tend to be a bit complicated. So I draw a big spider diagram first of he does that he knows her and she's a member of this and they're doing that but she's married to him but not anymore and she loves him and, and a big chart and then later on in the book I'll do another one with this leads to that this to this this is that um because I, I I write the book in lots of drafts I write a really quick one which is basically what I wrote on the board then I write another one which makes it make sense and then I write another draft in which I've got all the he says and she says in and his hair looked nice because in that those first books I wrote, I wrote beautiful sunset scenes and driving out to the coast. Like, oh my God, it's four o'clock and it's November. It's going to be dark. <laughs> yeah. You know, scrap, throw that away. Right. No sunsets. No sunsets until I know what time of day it is. You know, uh, and, you know, uh, and, and so on. Um, and then, you know, I'll do, and the, the fourth draft is when I do things like check the moon, check the tides, check the weather. You know, check whether what the cricket score was that week because one of my characters, uh, one of the, the MI500 uses cricketing analogies all the time. You know, he says, right, it's time for you to step up to the crease, sort of thing. And, uh, and he, he constantly using cricketing analogies, which I think must have done what my American publishers think about it. <laughs> yeah, this is a bit of, uh, but I thought that would be quite, that would be quite fun. And, uh, yeah, and just just get all it and just add all those add all those things in. And of course, you probably find as well. Do you, do you find your characters take over? No, see, I was having a discussion at the weekend. Mind you, as they're told. Yeah, yeah. I did the mind, you know, I I, I wrote I wrote a novel once, uh, not in this series, where there was a female minor character. She was a love interest, and she basically takes over the book. And so <laughs> it actually became a three hander. These two men are in love with her and her, and she basically because she was such a you know, she's this feisty little redhead who just takes over the book, and uh, people want keep wanting me to do a sequel about her. Nobody else, just about her. Uh, and likewise, as I said about my female characters in this book, they've they started to dominate the page because they're you know they're they're breaking out of convention. They're they're being different as well. So the characters do tend to well, my characters do tend to take over a bit. I'm thinking no. Julian's a bit dull. He wouldn't make a joke. You know, if he said that, he would actually mean it. You know, so his wife says, oh, Julian, you mustn't do that. He said, no, of course not. You know, we'll we'll write it into the, you know. And said, no, he actually means it. It's not being ironic. It's not putting what he actually means it. Uh, so I thought, oh, yeah, that's it. So they, they do take over. Yeah, I'm kind of jealous of this, actually. <laughs> that wasn't it. Yeah. Um, if you were able to spend a day with any author, dead or alive, who would you like to spend a day with? Oh, Tolkien. Tolkien, definitely. Definitely Tolkien. Because I, I, I think he was the per well, we all start with Indian Blind, people like that. But when I was about 
when I went to secondary school, they had a massive, great big copy of Coppers of Lord of the Rings on, on the, I thought, it, it hardback, black, big eye on. They looked fantastic, I said. So I took, I thought, after about a year, I thought, I'm going to read this. So I took it down off the shelf and I thought, I, I really, what is going on? So I put it back and then my mum bought me a copy of A Hobbit. I read that in days. Wow, right. Now I know what's going on. Now I can tackle that great big scary book with a red eye on the cover. Now I'd love, I'd love to talk, talk him. Uh, not only because of Lord of the Rings, but you know he was an Anglo-Saxon scholar and uh, had a you know very wide ideas about literature and fantasy and and uh, life generally. He, he would have been, a, I think, a very interesting man to to share a pint in the pub with. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's interesting. He's a popular choice, but. Some people they'd like to meet, you know, certain authors, but they're like they're really bad company <laughs> to spend a day with them like that. <laughs> like Dickens, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's one of the, I think they, they do say never meet your hero, don't they? Because they you know, you'll find that actually the you know, I have in, in my museum life I, I I met a number of quote famous unfake unquote people. And some of them were really interesting and some of them were totally obnoxious. Um, and you couldn't really guess, you know. I mean, Prince Andrew, for example, I showed him around. He was a real laugh, you know. Who'd, who'd have known? Um, you know, and... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've been quite lucky so far because obviously I've read, met so many authors. Although I've actually, yeah, saying that, like I've met Lee Child, who was awesome. And then I've met Kathy Wright, who was who I've loved oh, since yeah. um, an early teenager. She's one of the reasons I went and done mm. a French degree. She was quite um, closed off, I guess, is the most polite way of saying it. Weren't allowed to have pictures with her. Very blunt, sign the book, off you go, and that was it. Whereas Lee Charles yeah. was about random stuff, about living yeah. and growing up in the UK. So, yeah, I was like, yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you. I mean, uh, about the crime writing world, I've been in it for a few years now. Um, but everybody, most, just about everybody you meet is lovely. They, they're not competitive. They're not very. They, there's very little. My book is better than your book, type thing at all. There's no one-upmanship. It's very supportive and it's very, um, it's very generous. Yeah, and and lovely people to say what we spend most of our time doing. <laughs> plotting to kill people and overthrow governments and things like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it is, yeah, it is an incredible community. I'm so glad to be part of it. It's like the best thing I've ever found. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um. So after your book comes out tomorrow, what's coming next for you? Next for me, apart from crossing Morocco on a bus, um, which is the next adventure, uh, we've got... Um, after that, we've got uh, Death in the Dales at, at Sedba. So I'm speaking at that. I don't speak at very many places because my publishers are American, so I don't get invited to a lot to talk, which is a bit of a shame. Death in the Dales, um, and then I'm going away again, of course. But uh, what I'm the next the book I'm working on at the moment is a big archaeology book that I've been working on on and off for eight years, and I really, really ought to finish it. About uh, It's the report on the Roman fort uh, we've been excavating. Um, yeah, I've got a team of friends. We spend a, a month, we spend May each year out um, uh, digging holes in Alderney, the Channel Islands. I fly back to Crime Fest in the middle of it, go back. Do you ever wonder why I look so scruffy at Crime Fest? It's because I'm staying a month in Alderney and I only have digging clothes and T-shirts and combats. I don't have anything smart at all. I, I haven't got the luggage allowance. So I come to Crime Fest. I'll clean up the best I can and then go back to that. So I'll be doing the same next year as well. So a big, big book on the nunnery in, in Alderney. That's the one that's, that's, I'm currently editing it, which is tedious. It's 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 very, very tedious editing an archaeology book beyond the point. All the detail, oh, I'm sure, did I show, is that number right? Is that depth right? Is that measurement right? Oh, I've, I've said that before. Oh, that's yeah. tedious. And then I'm working um, on two other novel projects at the moment quietly uh in between but i mean i've written there's one book i've written half i've written about thirty thousand words in airports 
<laughs> airports and train stations. I haven't actually done any de work on my desk at all. It's all and hotel rooms. Um, it's it's I've been I've been nibbling at it. Um, so that's a mystery series. Uh, nibbling that for a few months now. But I think once the once the archaeology book is off to the peer reviewers, which is what they call beta readers and academic circles. <laughs> Once it's off to the peer reviewers uh, for them to tell me everything I've got wrong, um, I've then, it'll be then on with the next model. And um, yeah. Yes. yeah, that's and that, and that's it. Um, don't know about the black shirts, whether I'm going to do any more. Uh, the third book sort of rounds off the story arc set up in the first one. So, you know, if I never write any more, then you can say, yeah, okay, we, we sort of know what happens to all those people and they survived and they didn't and uh, they redeemed themselves and they didn't. Um, uh, I do have probably four or five more stories in that of that era I could write, but I think it just, just depends, you know, uh, what else well, I'll get also get involved in, really. Well, I can't think of any more questions for you unless you think there's anything obvious that I haven't no, asked. No, no, I think I think that's that's been lovely. Nice chat. So sort of talked about all the stuff and um yeah, I'll probably bump into you at I don't know. Somewhere. Next, yeah, definitely next, Prime Fest. Prime Fest. Definitely yeah. Prime Fest. Yeah. I'll, I'll be I mean I'll be everywhere probably. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you are you in the CWA? Am I? Yes, I am, yeah. Okay. I joined. Well, I'm, I'm organizing a sim. <laughs> okay, I'm organising a thing called the Northern Symposium in April, mm -hmm. uh, like a little day conference. So I might see you at that as well. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, do you just want to hold up your books again so everyone can see what they okay. go to Amazon and get after listening to Okay, you? these are available on Amazon in ebook or paperback. You must have the first one, like ebook or paperback. Um, this one's out tomorrow, it's already in pre order, out tomorrow. And this one is now. I think it's something like 79 pence on the ebook at the moment. That's like, that's like a promotion. So Black Shirt Masquerade is, uh, you can get it um, quite cheap on the ebook. And this one's at, at launch price, whatever the launch price is. Available in the UK, US, Canada, and Japan. So there we go. Black Shirt's marching your way. I shall put the link when I post the video as well. So if people can go straight. Thank you very much, Donna. Good to talk to you. You too. Okay. Cheers.